Okay, so I guess we're doing an impromptu Q&A type of thing, so. Words for me. Questions. There was so much stuff we said before the camera was I know, <laughs> but that's always where the best stuff happens, so. But you've always got great questions. Oh, well, we'll see. Um, so I've heard several different definitions for narcissism, and they're all good, and I'm not asking for clarification on that, but I have heard other things described, like I think you used the term Dio. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was just wondering if there are other levels, if you could describe that. Sure. Uh, I'll operating one, two, and three. I will. I will take a shot at it, and then these guys will uh, help me walk it back and, 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 imp and improve it. Um, Gnosis is best described as kind of the. Uh, I think. I would perhaps say that it, it becomes a significant starting point rather than an ending point, right? Um, if you were to completely remove it from uh, uh, religious terms, it would, it would essentially be uh, uh, seeing things as they are. And perhaps that's a little bit of an Eastern uh, answer, but seeing, seeing those things and incorporating those things, integrating those things into your spiritual path or, or your way of life is an entirely different thing. The analogy that uh, lots of Gnostic priests, including uh, uh, from other churches, have, have given of you know uh, parachuting uh, out of a out of a plane over a, a mountain top. You can see the paths that lead to the top. You can see the people at the top. You can see the dead bodies halfway up. You can see the people at the at the at the at the base camp. So you get a you 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 get a glimpse of things as they are and you land on the ground and you still have to walk it's not the same as walking to the top of the mountain as it were um, theosis uh, is a concept that comes from eastern christianity and basically means uh, divinization uh, now people have different ideas of what that means and sometimes it's used interchangeable with the term apotheosis um, but uh, I, th I think of apotheosis like deified roman emperors Right, like, you know, people who become gods, whereas theosis is, um, you know, becoming divine as opposed to becoming a distinct god somewhere on your own, on your own mountaintop, as it were. Um, so the experience of gnosis or succession of them, you know, integrated. There's the whole thing, of, you know, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. That, that type of thing is, you know, so you've had a spiritual experience. You still have to get up and go to work. You still, as I said the other day, you know, eat poop and sleep. Um, so, you know, I kind of liken a succession of those. The commas are very important in that yeah. phrase, <laughs> yeah. uh, You know, liken it to, um, uh, you know, uh, flashcards until you remember it completely, right? Um, so, uh, and, and Gnosis as, as our statement of principle, principles has it is a you know experiential and transcendent liberating experience of spiritual truth. Um, so it isn't uh, it isn't a, a, a once off thing. There 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 are waypoints, markers, and landmarks. But you have to keep going. Um, for that, I will hand it off for a better answer. One of the things that I think we sometimes miss is that gnosis is is a very general term. I mean, it covers a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, both in the, you know, in, in, in Greek and just as it has come to be used in, in, in our tradition. Um, so for me, you know, I, I use that as the kind of, of umbrella term and then talk about specific kinds of, of insights, you know, noetic apprehension, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, theosis, uh, stillness, those are all parts of, of gnosis. Those are all kinds of knowledge. And whenever we limit what we mean by, by knowledge, uh, we always go astray. And that's one of the biggest uh, errors of uh, sort of uh, Western scientism is that it, it picked up on one particular kind of knowledge and said, this is knowledge as such. Uh, whereas really it's, it's one kind and a very, very important kind of knowledge, but it isn't, it isn't knowledge as such. Um, so I think we need to be very, very careful when we're talking about Gnosis to recognize that this covers a variety 
of, of spiritual and intellectual um, experiences that, that can shape the way that we encounter the world. Uh, I was just going to add to that. Yeah, I mean, you, you have, uh, you know, the experience that produced the, the, the realities and poetics and mythology that you find in the Nag Hammadi, that's an experience of, of Gnosis. The, the uh, stuff about the Sethians and the, and the Five Seals, that's Gnosis. Um, you know, realizing that you share the divine spark with, you know, all of humanity beyond an intellectual, you know, uh, apprehension, or as Richard Smoley says, you know, love your neighbor as yourself because your neighbor is yourself. Um, that's a kind of gnosis, right? So there's, there's lots of, there's lots of different types. Um, your question's about theosis, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or if there's anything between gnosis and theosis. Right, okay. So, or if there's anything beyond theosis. I mean, I don't, I don't know all the whole range. Yep. Um, the way the word gnosis is generally used is necessarily vague because to some extent, or to a great extent, I think the the territory of, of spiritual life is disclosed by the methodology you use to access spiritual life. So if you're a um, if you're a Theravadan Buddhist practicing within the Burmese tradition, um, there are there is a specific practice that you undertake, or a specific set of practices you undertake, and in the conduct of that practice, there are very specific stages which. A uh, trained teacher can identify and guide you from one stage to the next. Those stages have very specific names and they're incredibly clear. Um, if you're a hesychast in a monastery on Mount Athos, then the practice of hesychasm undergoes very specific stages for which there's a very large literature and it has very specific names and a trained spiritual director is able to guide you through those very specific stages. Mostly in these conversations, we're not talking about a very specific practice tradition with a long history with very specific names and stages. There are practice traditions and they have a great deal of specificity about them. But by necessity, when we're talking in general terms about the spiritual journey, then this, the, this, the specificity of the stages and exactly what terms mean is, is going to be fairly broad, right? Um, the specificity is not there. So what his eminence is just pointing to in his last comment is that when, you know, if you're reading a Sethian text like the Secret Book of John, um, it's quite likely, as Father Tony pointed to the other day, that you're talking about, you know, it's a text that comes from a community of people who undertook a fairly specific set of practices. Um, I don't think they actually use the word gnosis, do they? I wasn't listening at all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sethians, do they use the does word gnosis? Does the Prophet of John use, use the word gnosis at all? I don't think it does. It might, but they, it would be translated in most editions. Into Coptic, so. so it, well, in English. Um, and it might just be used in a very general sense. Regardless. Right? Mm -hmm. So any, any text from the Nash that uses that uses the term gnosis is probably coming from a community of people that undertook specific practices and meant something quite, possibly meant something quite precise by it. So we're using that term in the wake of all that and and, uh, and an inability to understand like we don't have access to those communities we don't have access to those systems of practice we're using it in the wake of um, medieval Gnostic movements like the Cathars and the Bogomils and the Paulicians and whatever we're using it in the wake of the 18th century revival we're using it in the wake of Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society we're using it in the wake of the last 30 years of the New Age movement um, and countless people pick up the term gnosis and use it to mean something vague but specific enough, right? So it, it winds up not really being a technical term. It winds up meaning spiritual knowledge. Um, and I guess from usage, because you know, some people use it to mean an event. You have gnosis, and that means something like Satori and Zen. Mm -hmm. um, or a Kensho experience Kensho, or something like that. Say, yeah. Well, well, it's yeah. people use it in two different ways, yeah, right? So they use it enough. to mean like the mind-blowing moment of awakening which f fundamentally transforms you and leaves you different sometimes. And sometimes we often use it to mean 
one of them, you know, you, you used the analogy before of kind of multiple experiences, and, yeah. and one by one they kind of begin to sort of blow, blow the mind and heart open, but not as a one-off experience, as a progression of, of experiences. Um, we sometimes use it we, with an object. It slightly, slightly different way, sorry? We sometimes use it with an object, a gnosis of. Of something, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, it's, 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 so it becomes quite difficult to answer, like, is there anything between gnosis and theosis? Because it depends what, you, what, you, what we mean, what we're talking about when we talk about gnosis. Uh, um, so so that, that, that's, just the, that's just the legacy of, <laughs> of mm -hmm. the history that we've entangled ourselves with. There isn't really a precise way to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and people kind of, you know, spot redefine it in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. To come back to theosis, um, because that is a reasonably technical term that, that sits within a fairly specific system of practice, although, you know, also a thousand years long <laughs> in its own high ways and by ways. Um, uh, people often observe that the, the three phases of the Roman mystical, the Western church mystical system of um, purification, illumination, and union um, parallel uh, therapia, theoria, and theosis in the in the east. And theosis is the third of those those three stages, and that's probably not inaccurate. And these are very loose categorizations, but they roughly work. Um, so, therapia is where we get the word therapy. <laughs> Means healing. Um, and that's interesting to parallel with the, the Catholic term purification. Yeah. You think of purification as kind of removing grime and dirt, um, but you can also think of purification as having mind and awe and then smelting the ore in order to remove the pure metal. Um, so there's a kind of a, a healing of the pure metal in a way, in the, so that it's useful to think of purification in that way. So that's the first, in, in that sort of classic three-stage system, that first stage is having embarked upon the upon whatever path of practice that you're taking up, there's some refinement that happens mm -hmm. within your being where you begin to drop out adverse habits, let's say, or adverse kind of practices. Um, I don't think it's as simple as that, and I don't think that's a one-off phase, and I don't think the phase necessarily concludes, and I think the phase recapitulates itself various times through the course of the journey, but roughly, um, the second phase, which in the West is called illumination, in the East is called theoria. Theoria means illumination, so that's fine. That's where we get the word theory from. Um, and that's, uh, that's actually not a bad parallel to a lot of what people talk about when they talk about Gnosis. Um, because what characterizes that stage is illuminative experiences and they in some traditions that's an intellectual illumination where things become clear in other traditions that's a there's a visionary experiences where you you receive um, visions of the uncreated light or encounters with um, divine entities or whatever um, and that's a preparation for theosis um, and what's characteristic of the shift from theoria to theosis or from illumination to union um, is the dropping away of illuminative experiences and dropping into darkness. So the soul moves through what St. John of the Cross legendarily called the dark night of the soul um, and the attachment to the self begins to drop and the, the sense of self. You're saying that's in between? Between theoria and theosis classically. Some people talk about a dark night of the flesh <laughs> hmm. between therapy and theoria. Ah. I've never heard that. Well, there's also there's also um, the calling of the passions, theia, hmm. and nepsis, watchfulness. Yeah. There's a couple other bits in there. Well, do you want to? Well, let me let me finish my bit off, and then maybe you insert the. Oh, yeah, yeah I just can't remember where they go. Right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's I sick. mean, that, watchfulness is a fairly, that's a, that's back at the beginning. It's right? a base, yeah, it's part of what you do. Yeah. Right. But again, like the specificities around all this stuff and exactly what happens when and precisely where depends really exquisitely on, like, are you practicing centering prayer? Or are you, you know, like, we talk about hesychasm as though, we talk about hesychasm very, very loosely, but it's a thousand year old tradition. And there are specific teachers within the Hezekiah tradition and they will tell you, you know, one teacher will tell you to very definitely never ever do this thing that another teacher tells you that you must mm -hmm. make a core part of your practice and 
welcome to the diversity of, of long spiritual traditions. Um, theosis is, is the, the, the gradual the gradual loss of attachment to self um, and the gradual kind of like uh, fixation of the attention on the on God um, which doesn't mean you stop I mean people in that state you know many of the many of the deeper saints in the church hit that point and it's not union isn't like you know sitting on the top of a mountain and, and gazing into the eye of God it's a kind of a it's a a kind of a de-resing of the fixation with the self in favour of fixation with divinity, which then is, an, is a normal pouring of the self into service, but in a selfless kind of a way. So lots of us undertake service at various times in life. Um, and as you, as you move through life, you start to realise that a lot of what you're doing is, is, you know, playing out your egoic needs in the, in the path of service and, and what gradually shifts and transforms in that in that process is that it becomes less about you and more about what appears to be needed, I guess. Some people conjecture that there are stages beyond theosis. So Meister Eckhart talks about indistinct union. So that just remembering the parallel in the West to the, to the term theosis is union in the West. So Catholic mystics are very, very strict. St. Bernard de Clairvaux is very strict on the, on the while the, the self comes into union with God, the self is always distinct from God and that it's always a relationship, that there's never a loss of self into God or a fundamental union of God and self and that that, that language has parallels in the East. Um, Meister Eckhart has this term indistinct union where the, you know, without ever quite overcoming the separateness, <laughs> but there's still a blurring between the divine and the human. Mm -hmm. um, and then Bernadette Roberts uh, is a Catholic writer that I'm, I'm pretty fond of. Um, talks about stages after union where the, the presence of God in the, in the soul gradually kind of overcomes the, the self. So the sense of self becomes eroded and finally disappears. So you, you kind of become God, but <laughs> she's strict with the language. Like it's, that's, it's that very difficult thing to get your head around because fundamentally you're talking about something which requires the experiences other than any, any of us have ever had in order to really get. But um, the, the language she uses is that, and it's traditional language, that the, the faculties of the soul remain, but the self core of the soul is eroded and finally disappears. So you're still you, you're still, you operate in the world the same way you've always operated in the world, but there's something, that energetic center in the middle of the self that organizes most of your thinking and behavior begins to disappear and you become about <coughs> service in each moment. What is, what is this like the, it's, it's like the Western idea of the Eucharist, where the accidents, the, the outside, uh, remain intact, but the substance changes, basically. Um, I was going to add in, the other thing is, some of the things also about the language, particularly as you find in the, the Catholic and Orthodox traditions, is um, they necessarily because of things like magisterium and tradition they necessarily dance around a few things there there are things that they imply that they don't outright say because you know heresy and other stuff like that like theosis in in the in in the east um and talking about hesychasm um gregory palamas uh makes care in the in the triads which is his, his book on the same um, I've, I've read it twice. I had to read it twice because, <laughs> because it's impossible to read and I still don't understand most of it. Uh, uh, makes a distinction kind of, you know, in terms of uh, either experience of the divine or union with the divine that of energies versus essence. And energy uh, here isn't like energies like let's all go down to Sedona, Arizona and wave some crystals. Um, it's like uh, ener energia or energia, uh, which more means work, action, or, or operation. Do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, so we use the word erg. Yeah. That, that, that yeah it's actually yeah. A, a unit in, in physics. So if, if you were to experience the sun directly, you would die, right? However, you can know the sun experientially from the sunlight on your face. You can feel its work. You can experience the sun, but that's so you know the sun by its interaction 
uh, with the world and yourself, but you can't know it directly because you'd be you'd be zapped. So essentially, um, these monks who achieve theosis and glow in the dark, as the running joke uh, goes, is, is that they they are experiencing um, God's energies in that fashion versus the essence, and that the essence of God is unknowable because no one can see God and live, as it as it said, right? So so they make that kind of distinction. And Gregory Palamas. Uh, was at, at one point, um, I don't know, either exiled or in heresy or had fallen out and, and was um, rehabilitated and made a saint. And a lot of this stuff um, came out of his uh, vigorous debates with a philosopher of the day by the name of Barlam of Calabria. Uh, and that's where he, that's where he made the, the distinction between energies and uh, essence. So there, so there is a little bit of kind of policing the tradition or the, or the boundaries uh, to make sure that they don't uh, fall, <laughs> fall into heresy, as it were. The other thing I was going to mention on the process between gnosis and theosis is that some people describe gnosis as a process of acquaintanceship. Um, the, you know, a, a good example from uh, one of John Michael Greer's books um, talks about the difference between knowing versus knowing about. Um, I know math. I know mathematics or I know architecture versus I know Tony Sylvia. Um, the I know Tony Sylvia is, is a relational thing, right? There's a certain kind of knowledge that comes about, uh, to continue the example from Greer, um, that a, uh, a shoemaker has with the leather, stuff that comes over time and experiential things, things that can't necessarily be put down on paper and experiential uh, relationship, much in the same way where you know you have a uh, relationship with family or friends in a way that you can't you can't turn them into a checklist of things to know. There are instinctual things that come with that. So I can make I can make propositional statements about them. Yeah. Right. I can say, well, they're this tall and their hair is this color and they're carrying this and they're wearing that. And and if our purpose yeah. is to pick them up at the train station, well. That's fine. That's enough. That's all we need. That's the only kind of knowledge we need. But if we're going to talk about what it means to know a person, that, that, that's a fundamentally different kind of knowing. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's like the, you know, the Buddhist exercise of, you know, who are you, right? It's like, well, my name's John McCann. I'm five, nine-ish. Yep. And, you know, and uh, 41, it's like, hey, well, you've told me your age, your, your name and all this stuff, but who, who are you? Like, you, you talk about mm -hmm. not, not, the, not, the, not the actual thing. Yeah, and the actual thing is, is uh, relational. So I would, I would say in a more loosey-goosey, vague fashion, the, the distance between the two is, is a relational thing and a, and a deepening of uh, that as well. For me, it's, I don't think we can talk about theosis without uh, talking about Athanasius of Alexandria. Oh, yes. Um, you know, very famous you know, pronouncement that... On the incarnation of the word. Yeah, that yeah. God, God became human so that humans might become God. And this, this um, theopoiesis, right? This, this making divine. Uh, is is ultimately the whole point of the incarnation is is to afford us a possibility of of transformative experience that reunites us and reintegrates us with the divine person and and that's made possible by uh, not in any sort of vicarious atonement sense but by by the the real presence of of Christ in the world, and and so for me, this is immediately tied up with the mysteries of the Eucharist and and liturgical practice, and and that's why I, I, I'm always uh, sort of a little struck when people talk about going to mass or going to the liturgy as if it were almost an ancillary thing, right? Oh, it's the, the, this thing that we do. Right and, and and you know so every Sunday or once a month or whatever you know we we you know do the liturgy um, without realizing that that that's where the work happens that that's that 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 is part of theosis that the 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 celebration of the Eucharist in particular is this moment at which the the theophantic event makes possible 
theopoiesis. It's a little bit like matches and candles, right? I mean, you can you can strike some flint out in the, in the wild, but kind of, you know, like begets like, like after a fashion. Um, you know, the liturgy doesn't, uh, you know, create the experience, it creates the space where the experience can occur. Mm. Um, there was, a, there was a, another point that I was going to, but I don't, see, I haven't had enough coffee today. Um, there was a point I was going to make in what you said, and now I can't remember what it was. Does that get close to your coming? question? No, yes. Okay, good. Should we just keep talking about theosis and theophany and apotheosis? All those wonderful words. It, it, it stops being a Q and A and just oh, becomes. A, I I I, rem I remember. Or? I, I remember what I was going to say. Okay. So, um, in in the whole Joannine Joannite early community thing, um, which you know I dig into uh, in my Joannite lecture from Sydney, the. Um, I mean, we take it, we take it, and we stretch it out much longer. So I'm not going to say that this is the small O Orthodox position, but the the greatest sacrifice, the the, the greatest thing in the uh, in the life of Jesus um, isn't so much the crucifixion as it is the incarnation itself. Mm -hmm. uh, as it's one of the our first crucifixion, yeah, exactly. You know, on the cross of space and time. And uh, you know, it's the sacrifice, sacrifice of the divine into the limitations of matter. And uh, uh, you know, when, when, that, when that touches the world, and by the world, I, I guess I mean the cosmos, um, it uh, you know, unlocks essentially the, the possibility or, or, or make, makes possible or makes real um, the ability for, for everything to be elevated to that level. That's uh, and, and, and yet, I, I want to be, I would want to be a little bit careful about this because I, I think the scholastic notion that, that entry into matter is necessarily uh, just a diminution, is just a sacrifice, yeah. misses an important point that, that the, the incarnation is also transformative, transformative of divinity. Yeah. And, and that, that being incarnated is not just oh, well, I took the ghost and I stuck it in the machine and now it's imprisoned and now it can't do the things that it could do if it didn't have a body. That very platonic notion of the soul where the soul is just sort of trapped in the tomb, right? The soma sama thing that we've been, been playing on this whole weekend. Um, but rather that in and through the lived experience of the human body, the soul is transformed in a fundamental divinizing way that there is something that divinity acquires, I won't say gained, but acquires um, through incarnation and that transformation is a positive one. Yeah. So I think we've got to be very, very careful not to fall into that particular metaphysical trap. I also, I would say, you know, you have in the mythology of, around Sophia the idea that she seeds the divine spark into you know, uh, uh, humanity, individual. I would, I would take the incarnation and say that's the, that's the, the process writ across the entire of the universe. That's mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that uh, um, uh, in large. There was something I was going to say about that. Yeah, because you had a really good point about that. You need a note progression. Yeah, yeah I know. I need more coffee. I didn't have coffee. It's my first coffee. So, uh, funny you had a deacon. Yeah. Well, he got me this coffee to begin. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, your, your question? I have your questions. Oh. Do you have statements? <laughs> well done, you. Do you have propositions? I have nothing to contribute. So. I, I have another question. Cool. Uh, I, I was oh. gonna, I was going to mention a thing related to kind of this rough circle we've been drawing out with Gnosis and Incarnation. Um, Monsignor Bray a while ago, and I, I mentioned this uh, in informal conversation, talked about, because uh, the topic of the Holy Spirit was uh, going on at uh, uh, St. Mary's Parish, and he mentioned, uh, he was talking about uh, uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit as being the only unforgivable sin, as scripture would have it, and that you can, you can literally deny Christ and still come back from it, because Peter did, right? Mm -hmm. And, the, and my take on that, the reason why going against the Holy Spirit was the big no-no um, is because it goes against the ongoing presence of God 
in the in the universe or in the lives of, of human being kind of thing. It's a it's a it's a blanket denial versus uh, you know I just think Christ is a is a jerk kind of thing. Uh, sorry, your question. No, that's fine. I didn't know if there was a perspective from like temple theology about. Oh boy! Um, <laughs> wow! I'm gonna go get that coffee now. <laughs> <laughs> about theosis or gnosis, or if there's a, a different uh, perspective on it. Yeah, there is. Um, I think from Barker's point of view. Yeah, Gnosis is something quite specific in that context. It's the, it's the knowledge acquired from the vision of the Holy of Holies. Mm. So when someone, you know, a lot of, a lot of this stuff that gets called apocryphal um, that Barker labels temple talk, so a lot of the visionary stuff in Enoch, Ezekiel's visions, a lot of the stuff that's in Revelations, they're all, that's Gnosis, because what the, what's being written is someone's vision gazing into the Holy of Holies, gazing into day one of the, the whole of the cosmos in union with the divine, and then what they see. Um, so that's, that's Gnosis. Um, and those things are written experiences, but the, the deeper the sense of it is that the, the, person's, the person that has those visions is participating, participating in this this ongoing vision of a cosmos unified. Um, I think, I mean, theosis isn't a term that would have been used, mm. um, but I think she relates it to, to the idea of resurrection, to, mm. to birth from above. Um, and that's the, that comes as a result of sitting on the cherubim throne because the, the high priest sits on the cherubim throne and is anointed and, and becomes the king and becomes the high priest. Um, so the, the, the trick from, you know, like in first temple language, that, that happens to the king, right? Um, hand wave 700 years. <laughs> by, the, by the time we get to the first century, we're talking about that as being an experience that's shared by mystics and regular people and, you know. So we're talking about, um, we're talking about the I mean if she's right in saying that baptism plus confirmation equals being enthroned as a priest, right? Then what used to be the exclusive province of the royal high priest of the first temple becomes congratulations, the regular experience of the ordinary Christian mm -hmm. by the present day. Um, the Eucharist is an, is an exclusive experience of the priesthood in the temple. The Eucharist becomes a regular, you know, daily, if you want it, the experience of the regular Christian. So there's some kind of democratization happening in there that, you know, we all love talking about, we all love talking about kings and high priests and it's all very romantic and delightful, but, um, and it, it shifts from being, you know, this massive once a year thing that happens to a thing that happens at a, at a table in a tiny room. <laughs> In, in very humble circumstances, so yeah, I guess that's what I want. I think that one of the things that I, I, I know I harp on this a lot is is that you know there is this inherent elitism in in Gnosticism. It's that we become priests and kings, right? But what's important about that elitism, and and you know I've gotten hammered for this uh, because I'm probably not expressing it as well as I ought to, is that this, that, that the door to that elite is standing wide open. Uh, that this is not uh, pr a prior selection. It's not, oh, well, if you've got this bloodline or if you've undertaken these practices or, or if you um, adhere to this set of rules or you profess these particular truths or whatever, it's you walk in the door. Or if you're the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. Which I mean. <laughs> there's, there's an elite amongst plumbers. Well, right. There are really good plumbers that are really good at plumbing. Mm -hmm. well, really the, whole, the whole language of mastership. Right. To be a really good plumber, you've got to apprentice yourself to a good plumber. You've got to learn a lot of the technical material about plumbing. You've got to practice as a plumber for probably a good 10 years, mm -hmm. a good 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. And then you might be considered amongst the, the fellows in your trade as a good plumber. And they might be prepared to work with you. Um, it's really elitist. 
Yeah. It's really elitist. Mm -hmm. but and spectacularly democratic. You are, you are welcome, you are welcome as a plumber. <laughs> I have a question about therapy, theoria, and theosis. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the constellation of philosophy. Um, I believe she has a pie at the bottom of her dress and a theta at the top, so praxis, and then a ladder to theoria. Right. Um, where does praxis fit in? to purification, illumination, and union, or therapy, theory, and theosis? I would say that, first of all, uh, any kind of, of catharsis, of purification, has got to also be a praxis. Um, and, and, and so I think that it, praxis is shot through, um, but it shows itself most manifestly at the beginning. Um, and I think that what happens is, is it's harder to see the role that praxis plays in those uh, second and third stages if you're standing outside of them. If you are undergoing them, it is inherently practical. <laughs> there is, there's no avoiding practice there. Um, so I think that that the, all, this all will ultimately turn on pragma, on things. I, I don't think we can get away from, from the, to use the absolutely horrible word, the, the thinginess of what we are doing. Um, because it's always acting upon, it's acting upon the body, it's acting upon the world, it's acting upon relations with, with, with objects and living things and its gestation and digestion and, and all of these things. And these are about pragma. These are about things. And, and so I think when we're looking at the, the, that first stage of, of purification, of, of catharsis or, or whatever we want to call it, um, the pragmatic is at the core. But it doesn't go away. It, 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 it never stops. So, so for me, this is always about practice. And, that, and that's, why, that's why the liturgical is so important for me. Mm -hmm. right? And why the, the Eucharistic is so important. Because the, the, the celebration of the Eucharist is the, the, the coming into pragma of, of spiritual essence. That it, it becomes a thing. I can hold it in my hand. I can I can put it into my mouth. I can I can taste it. I can feel it. Um, and, and I think that 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 is is vital, vitally important. It's very different. Uh, the act of the the institution of the Eucharist is very different from Pentecost. Right? Pentecost is a giving over of the spirit. Right? The Eucharist is a giving of a thing. Out of an object, and those two are not opposed to one another. It's a, a similar process, but it takes these two very, very different forms. And so, I think that that always remembering that there is a, a praxis involved uh, is vitally, vitally important. And I'm more interested in sharing in sharing a praxis with a community than I am with sharing some propositional uh, creed or some set of beliefs. Uh, I think what makes, especially the Apostolic Joanite Church, a, a, a community is not that we all think the same, because Lord knows we don't, but, but that we have a kind of relationship to, to things that is, is shared in a, very, in a very concrete sort of way. Thank you. Sorry, I missed the beginning, so maybe you can address this, but what you said just sparked a question. Um, but don't we have to have a shared understanding of the theology in order for the pra practice to be effective? I think on a, on a fundamental level, on a, base, on, a, on, a, on a baseline level, for sure. Um, and, and, you know, so there, there has to be this, um, God, what's the word that Aristotle uses um, for unanimity or it's sometimes translated as concord? Um, God, I'm, it's escaping me from the moment. Uh, homonoia. Um, uh, uh, homonoia is, is an interesting sort of concept because it's sometimes used in, for example, Aristotle's political writings as just 
shared political beliefs, right? Um, but then in the Nicomachean Ethics in particular, he begins to think of it in terms of this, this relationship between friends that allows them to, to have a single heart, which is why I love the, the, the translation of homonoia as concord, right, of a, of a shared heart. Um, those are, are deeply practical sorts of things. It's not just about, about agreement on, on principles, but at the same time, there has to be that fundamental agreement. We have to at least be speaking the same language. Well, would... Hominoia sounds like... I'm sorry? Hominoia sounds like the mind that is shared between... Yeah, the it's Trinity. literally, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Trinity. Yeah. yeah. I would, the only thing I would, I would um, add to kind of, you know, stretch that out into the vague territory for which I am known um, is the old... The, the old, old, you know, church saying of lex orandi, lex credendi, in the, in the sense that the, um, the law of prayer is the, is the law of belief, or how you pray is, is what you believe. Um, some people reverse those things. Some people use the, uh, you know, the second to explain the, the, the first, and we kind of do the first and let it speak for itself to the individual without telling them necessarily kind of, you know, well, here's what just, here's what just happened to you. Well, I think, no, 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 it's, it, it's this, right? We kind of leave it a little bit more open-ended, which for some is, is, a, is a virtue and others is a curse. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, think, I do think we let the first part kind of stand more on, more on its own. And don't forget the most important part, which is lex talionis. Sure. Yeah, look it up. Yeah, no, I know what it is. <laughs> uh, yes, we... <laughs> I was just trying to work out if you were doing yoga at the back of the room or what was happening. Okay, well then I'll... <laughs> Diana, can I quickly, did, is that, did that respond to your yes, question? Is that, where's, where's praxis for you and all that? I'm, I'm interested in hearing all of it from you. I went very theoretical on your practical question, so I apologize for that. So. <laughs> I prefer the theoretical. Um, and because I prefer the theoretical, I'm trying to locate the practical. I'm trying to... Um, I repeatedly come to a practice and let it fall away. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for me to develop theory and to develop an understanding of a subject than it is to get into the nitty gritty and do a thing mm -hmm. and do a practice and say mm -hmm. a prayer. Um, on a, you on, and pretty on much everybody time. else, sister. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's this. Uh, we all struggle. With that, and I think that that is a that is a, a con I know for me, so I'm, maybe I'm just projecting my own experience, which is is so much like what I'm hearing from you, where where yeah, yeah, I'm sitting and thinking about these things. That's what I do for a living. Um, actually, like you know, engaging in prayer, or engaging in a practice. Or, or, you it's know. not as much fun for me. No, no, I it's definitely not as much fun. It probably is, um, and I mean, I have my barriers that I'm trying to address. And finding a way through practice to address the barriers to practice is maybe kind of what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. It's a short, hopefully a, a small way in to a larger union. I look forward to hearing from you during Center and Prayer Phenostics later today. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Uh, before we, because we're on the uh, uh, tail end, because we want to get it set up for the next thing, was there any other questions? I guess I, uh, I find myself thinking about the, the, uh, the, uh, in all this, in the, in the apparent, uh, lack of consistency. Uh, uh, between what is supposed to be happening, say, in a liturgical situation, uh, and what is actually happening. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, oh, I, well, Carl Jung was a boy, uh, uh, going to the communion of his church and, 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 uh, uh finding that uh, you know, the, mostly the bread was dry and the wine tasted crummy. Mm -hmm. Or, I don't want to knock Catholics, 
particularly, but but the the uh, uh, the Catholic priest, you know, celebrating the Eucharist, and then apparently, and I don't know that Catholics are any worse than anybody, but apparently, in some cases. Um, going off and, and, and violating the altar boy, uh, uh, you know, or... One of the challenges of any kind of, of spiritual life is making those spiritual insights real, making them, making them play out in the mm -hmm. world. And, and I think that there, there's always a challenge to us to, to, to live as we walk. And, and again, speaking only for myself here, that's a constant challenge to, to I mean, in something as simple as me, you know, driving over here today and, you know, screaming blue murder at my, at my sat nav, um, you know, isn't particularly bringing the, 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 the stillness that comes in hesychasm into my life. Um, a small example, of course, your, your example is much more grave. But, but I think that we're always struggling to make the spiritual practical, to make the theoretical practical. And, and that, that division lies at the heart of, of what it is that we do. Well, I think there's, I'm, there's, I'm not sure I caught your question. How do we, how do we reconcile the, the difference between the ideal and the reality, basically? Is that, is that what you're asking? Well, yes, but also the fact that, that the... the uh, that uh, uh, that the the uh, the reality um, uh, the reality of the, of the, the let's say the liturgy may be going on uh, despite in some way uh, the inconsistency uh, with what's going on. I don't know anything about the first temple, but the the uh, uh, the uh, we say the, the 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 priest was sitting in the womb of of the goddess and so and so. If you could somehow go back in time, uh, the king, I mean, uh, and cross-examine these people, goodness knows what the actual king was really thinking at that mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. and, and, but maybe that doesn't completely invalidate the uh, the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the liturgical thing. The, the, what's the uh, 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 let's see? One of the Catholic things that became one of the the thirty nine Anglican articles. The, 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 the dep depravity of the priest interfereth not with the efficacy of the sacrament. Yeah. Right, right, right. And broken vessels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think there, there's a certain amount of things where, you know, some things are aspirational, some things are invitational, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there, of course, you know, there are vows, there are ideals. Um, I would liken it to uh, marriage. I mean, when the, when the couple, whoever they may be, are standing at the altar or the justice of the peace or, or whoever, um, they're saying, you know, I do. And, and up until that point, they have else they probably still wouldn't be in the marriage if, you know, one of them was a scumbag or, mm -hmm. or any number of things. But from that point on, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a measuring stick, not, uh, not a concrete reality to which they have to check themselves against on a minute-by-minute, day-by-day, week-by-week, year-by-year um, uh, basis. You know, so far this is really good, and I, and I promise to continue to be good. Um, and that's something that's you know uh, renewed on a on a on a regular basis. Not not merely through uh, um, you know let, well let's take our, our vows again after ten years or or, or twenty years, but on a on a daily basis. Like you know I'm driving my wife nuts from minute to minute, minute but she's 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 not leaving me <laughs> yet. Uh, you know that the, the, there's uh, uh, yeah I I think that's the there's always going to be a certain amount of distance just by the very nature of being human beings and not just in the, in the sphere of the priesthood but in anything in our jobs in our in our relationships um, between the image we create and the figure we cut right and the idea is to not be two different people or to not be two different things to you know that you know our internal facing and our external facing 
are, are the, 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 the same thing. And I mean, that's really the challenge, in, in, in my opinion, of, of the spiritual path itself. Our Eucharist talks about having, you know, no separation between the inner and the, the outer. And uh, I, I think that's the, the challenge for, for every member, but especially for every priest, especially for every bishop, because we're the people who get up in front of other people and say, we're going to do this, right? So there is, um, there, there is or should be a higher standard. And would you say that this is also, and this is sort of the heart of both of, of Jungian thought, of Gnosticism, and of Plato. It's like in Jungianism we have the archetype of reintegration, right? Programmed all of us, so why are we all reintegrated? In Gnosticism we have the pleroma, why aren't we part of the plural pleroma? In Plato we have the forms, why aren't we the perfect copy of the forms? And that, would you say, this is me really making a statement, but I am asking, asking a question. <laughs> Would you say that this is this is part of the the existential struggle? This is sort of the heart of part of what we do when we adopt these philosophies of the world. Is 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 figuring that out both in myth or practice, right? Well, I, I I think you know, and and perhaps this is going to you know date or confine some of my interest you know reading over the past twenty years. But I think it was actually Dion Fortune who said something about religion being a cultural interpretation of spiritual truth that I mean it's really I don't think that's necessarily spiritual truth or a, a cultural thing or a religious thing it's a human thing um, I think that's the I, I think different uh, different religions and pract practices and methodologies are going to approach it different um, but I think that uh, that thing and, and the potential disparity between them um, is universal yeah. Um, and I know it's universally true of leadership, whether in, uh, you know, a church like ours or the Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, um, political leadership, right? I mean, we you know, flip open a page anywhere and you're going to see examples of it. And this isn't a case of everybody's guilty, so, you know, no one's to blame, right? Um, uh, the, you know, there is, it is, if, if anything, this should... Uh, motivate us to get better at what we do to to bridge that gap better because we've got so many we've got so many uh, examples right I, there's a latin saying that says why are you laughing change the name and the jokes on you mm. right I, I can't remember what the, the the latin is so i think um you know uh, I, I i i don't think we should confine ourselves to whistling past the graveyard right i, I think we can we can look at these things internally whether they be whether they be small things, small uh, peccadillos, you know, mistakes we may make, and the fact that most of us are hypocrites by nature of being human beings, um, we should we should take all those things as uh, uh, signposts, land, land, landmarks, watchwords, however you want to have it, um, and use them to triangulate ourselves into the right spot, yeah. I guess, as it were. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good ending point. I thought that was a really, really summed that up well. Wink. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Thank, thank you guys you. for thank all you. of your questions. Thank you.